in the Quran, the violence is prescribed. It is exhorted. It is ordered. Believers, as such, are told to fight against unbelievers, as in the passage that I quoted, chapter 9, verse 29, during the talk, that fight against those who do not believe in Allah and his messenger, even if they are the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This is, in Islamic theology, considered to be an order that is normative for all time for the Islamic community. And so, and there are Muslims today who consider it their divine responsibility to wage that war and to fight against the unbelievers. And they consider that they are pleasing God by doing so. Now, in contrast, in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, however you may want to call them, what you will find in there is that particular people are told this, but there's no open-ended or universal command analogous to that in the Quran, where believers as such are told to fight against unbelievers. There are particular people who are told to do these things. Also, neither book, neither the Bible nor the Quran, so in other words, the, the violence is descriptive but not prescriptive, but also in the Bible and in the Quran, they don't exist in isolation. These books are part of larger traditions religious traditions, political traditions, civilizations, and so on and so on. And as, it, as, as, as they unfolded, you will find that there is a tremendous embarrassment among exegetes, both Jewish and Christian exegetes, throughout history, about those passages in Deuteronomy and Joshua and wherever else they are. Uh, and that horrible psalm about happy is the man who takes your babies and dashes them against the rock and all that. Um, those kinds of things are spiritualized in the exegesis of them, generally. The Jews and the Christians do that, do that spiritualizing in very different ways, but it is done. In other words, you will not find authorities or scholars, either Jewish or Christian, saying Joshua took out cities, and therefore Christians ought to take out cities when necessary. Uh, there, you won't find, even in history, even at the time of the Crusades, for the most part, where there are some notable exceptions, these passages being quoted in justification of violence in those ages. You will, however, find that there is no corresponding spiritualizing of those passages. By that I mean that it says, well, it says, you know, these armies fought and so on and so on. That means we have to struggle against sin. That's what the, the, the commentators and exegetes generally say about these Bible passages. Whereas the Quran passages, unfortunately, do not find Muslim scholars saying, this means struggle against sin. Not even the Sufis do that. The Sufis are the Muslim mystics who do spiritualize a good bit of the Quran. They do not spiritualize the teachings about jihad, and actually they do fight, notably in Chechnya, arms jihad themselves. But in any case, we find the mainstream Muslim commentators on the Quran actually take these passages, particularly because of the principle of abrogation, or al nas the the principle of Nasik is that uh, if something is given chronologically later in Muhammad's career that contradicts something that was given earlier, then the, what comes later takes precedence. Unfortunately, early in Muhammad's career, he taught tolerance. Later in Muhammad's career, he taught warfare against some believers. And so the mainstream exegesis or understanding of those passages in the Quran is that Muslims have an ongoing responsibility to wage war against unbelievers, whereas there is no Jewish or Christian sect anywhere in the world that is considered mainstream or orthodox that teaches that Jews or Christians have some sort of ongoing responsibility to wage war against unbelievers. And so this is the, 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 the ways in which these passages are understood is vastly different. Yes, sir? Um, there still doesn't seem to be anything that's fundamentally different to me about, as you say, the Old Testament and um, the Quran. Neither of them went particularly well for you know, critical analysis. And well, we're not talking really about whether each is true here, you know? I mean, I understand that's a very important question and so on, and uh, uh, it's certainly worth investigating, but in terms of critical analysis, it's not really relevant to our considerations either way. I'm not here to uh, say that any particular religious tradition is true or false. I'm talking about a political uh, threat to uh, freedoms that people of all, all beliefs ought to value. Okay, but even then, like, even then, the question revolves around not the text, but the interpretation. Um, even when we were to look at the Old Testament, those, as you described before, those could be precedents. Even if there weren't prescriptions and they were more descriptive, that seems to set a precedent. And we do have examples of, um, of that being used. Like, in America, 
maybe earlier in the 20th century, it was used to um, judges would use it would use the Old Testament to justify, you know, not I get to to ban interracial marriages. Really? Yeah. Used to me. Anyway, if that was done, those guys were stupid, and I don't support that. Yeah. You, you raised your I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. He said, he said that uh, Israel is one of the most important democracies, if I'm not putting my phone over, um, uh, in the Middle East. But I was just wondering about the 2008-2009 when the conflict started in Gaza, and Israel refused access to a lot of the reporters to Gaza. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a serious violation of human rights? And then another thing, in France in 1990, the Jewish lobby helped adopt a law against negationism, which is the denial of war crimes. I'm sorry, the Jewish lobby did what? Adopted a law in 1990 in France, and it was illegal because it was adopted in the middle of the night. And, um, Wait a minute, it, how can the Jewish lobby adopt a law in France? They helped adopt a law through the uh, members of the parliament in 1990. So and France, the French parliament enacted yes. the law? Yes. Okay, but the Jews were behind it? Uh, the Jewish part, crime of minister, uh, English is not my first language. So no, I understand. Yeah, I think um, I get you. Loud I just here. think that uh, I was just wondering to what extent you think that <clears throat> in, uh, denying any war crimes would be a um, a violation of freedom of speech. I think that uh, freedom of speech should be free and unfettered, uh, and. Uh, I don't. They don't support any restrictions on freedom of speech at all. So you think that what happened in Gaza, it was wrong from uh, Israeli authorities? And yeah, I'll tell you what I think was wrong. Let her ask the question. What happened in Gaza was uh, what's going on? I'm not talking. He was just like helping out. So it's fine. Okay. Yeah. What happened in Gaza that was wrong was this. Uh, there was a uh, concerted effort by the Palestinians, by Hamas to uh, launch attacks from civilian areas mm -hmm. in order to draw retaliatory fire that they could use for propaganda purposes by making it appear that Israel was firing upon civilians. And uh, that was it, was, it was very clever, and it was certainly well executed and very successful, as we can see from the Farago that is the Goldstone Report. Uh, in terms of what the response to that should be, I think it should be exposed. And I have done uh, my bit to expose it. Um, and the, the, the fake war crimes that were thus constructed there ought to be exposed. And so here again, the antidote to bad speech is more speech and not the restriction of speech. Insofar as there were any actual restrictions on any freedom of speech, I oppose those. But uh, see, the, the idea of support for Israel is uh, not any more than support for the United States, support for every single policy. Uh, don't support pretty much any policy that the United States government has enacted in regard to meeting the threat of the jihad since September 11th, 2001. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I'm not, in, not an American or not in support of America. When it comes to Israel, the problem is, is that there's such a sophisticated propaganda campaign against it, it's hard to tell what the facts really are. But the uh, fabrication of fake war crimes by the Palestinians is well documented, and I invite you to look into it. Yes, sir. You raised an interesting point that I'd like to hear you uh, go on a little bit more uh, about some of the differences between uh, some of the older uh, Old Testament verses, like uh, the, the rules uh, promulgated in Leviticus. Uh, now I'm, I'm Roman Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I'll avoid all that. And actually, during your talk, when you were uh, when you mentioned a few quotes from the Quran. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind were a few things from Leviticus. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I think myself, like most Catholics or most Christians, believe that the Bible is the inspiring word of God. And yet we've managed to tone back the stone names, the, uh, the various rules on who's allowed to come into the church or not if they're unclean. And, and you mentioned that, uh, that in the Judeo-Christian tradition there's been a spiritualizing or a uh, modernizing those beliefs to, uh, to a, a more, uh, more respectful, more peaceful way of life. I'm curious what makes you think uh, that, the, that despite the fact that the vast majority of, uh, of 1.5 billion Muslims are not engaged in a violent struggle, it makes you think that the handful of uh, commentaries that you've referenced represent the, the Muslim approach to those individual verses, and that Muslims are not, they, are not themselves able to spiritualize and bring those verses into context with the peaceful existence. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. 